Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. So today as we continue to build the Paladins of Chivalry website we're going to edit the who we are section or the about section as it's known. So first step upload a appropriate photo this is obviously the default template that it's come at and I've selected what I think is quite a funny photo there and now we just simply click on the text box and we can start typing away about some stuff about Paladins of Chivalry which as I said before is my medieval reenactment group and it is really that easy you can see we've got the full text editing suite just up there at the top so you can change the color bold center italics um, font and so on and so forth but it really is just as easy as clicking on a text box and if you want a new text box you can add that but we'll see that in another tutorial you can also adjust the size of the text box if you want the text to run further along which i might do depending on how much i eventually end up writing since the photo is taking up a little less space than the stock one did and of course I can keep typing on like this or if I want the text to be in a slightly different location for the next paragraph I can then just as I said create a new text box and it will show me that text box highlighted in blue. And for the moment I think I'm done I'll come back to it later. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes but you never know you might want to do it for some other reason then head over to squarespace.com forward slash drakinafel you can get a free trial and once you're ready that little link will give you 10 percent off your first website or domain so thanks once again to squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show hello everybody um today we're looking at something a little bit unusual we have a special guest with us today and uh, we're going to learn all about the type 82 destroyer hms bristol so um obviously people know who i am um if you'd like to introduce yourself okay hi folks um i'm rob griffin my regular service covers longer than i care to recall um I've done reserve um, at the moment. Now, to finish off the time, still in uniform, I'm first lieutenant to Chess Gloucester in Gloucester, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of retired and I'm a well published author. And HMS Bristol's my first one for the Royal Navy. Um, hopefully, more to follow. Excellent. So, um... Obviously, as a, you know, as we said, we're going to be talking about HMS Bristol. So I guess we'll start right at the beginning. Um, what were the origins of HMS Bristol and the Type 82 design generally? OK, um, it was decided by the government of the day that um, we needed new carriers. So there was a design for four super carriers, although it was soon reduced to three. This became well known as CVA 0, 1, 2 and 3. CVA-1 had the unusual um, distinction of actually being named by Her Majesty, or Her Late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, uh, before anything had been cut. The other two are rumoured to have been Prince of Wales and Duke of Edinburgh, and the cancelled one should have been Ark Royal. Um, the, the escort vessels we had then were sort of getting a bit long in the tooth or weren't um, suitable of carrier escorts. So a new vessel was designed and it's going to be a class of four or six, depending on which um, data you read. Um, HMS Bristol was the lead ship. Um, she was laid down and was going to be the escort for these new carriers. Unfortunately, then what happened was um, they decided we couldn't afford all the carriers. So one by one, they were cancelled, which left the government with the embarrassment of a three quarters built destroyer on the slipway. Um, to cut the losses, they decided they would finish that and cancel the others. Um, Bristol was launched as the um, only Type 82, hence her sort of subtitle is HMS Bristol in a class of her own. Okay. So what did the Type 82 class as a, a, a sort of as a design offer compared to the anti-submarine warfare and anti-aircraft warfare vessels that were current at the time you mentioned they the ones they had weren't really suitable to escort the cvao ones so what what did bristol bring to the table that they didn't have um well the others were basic classes frigates and they, as you said anti-submarine so they were specialized in the anti-submarine role um the type the 12 actually could motor along about 30 knots, which is quite fast. Um, but they weren't capable or designed to escort the carrier battle group as we've seen today. Um, Bristol was launched and 
it was decided um, to use her as a um, trial bed, test bed for all the new equipment was coming in. At one stage, she was the most heavily armed warship in the Navy. She was the first to carry um, the ubiquitous 4.5-inch gun, which is just going out of service. As we see with Glasgow, we'll have the 5-inch. Um, she carried the Limbo Mortar, which was well established, and the other two ships we've already mentioned did carry that. Um, she was also the first to carry ICARA, uh, which is an Australian weapon system, um, which could de um, deploy a, a home, homing torpedo at a range of at a range of about ten nautical miles. Um, the idea behind that was if the ship picked up a submarine and then closed on it, it put itself at risk. So stand off 10 mile away, launch Icara. It was a missile um, launcher carrying a, sub a torpedo. It also had the limbo, as we've said, and various small arms. So it was used very much as a test bed. Um, outstanding thing about it, it was combined gas turbine and steam turbine. Um, this came in very very handy because about a year after she was commissioned, there was a massive major fire in the steam turbine room and it looked as though the ship was going to be lost. The fire was that intense that even today, if you go what used to be um, the XO's office, but originally with the uptakes, you can run your hand down it like that and then it goes in but the heat buckled it. So for two, three years, she ran on gas turbines only um, so it proved the idea that if, if it was in conflict and one room got knocked out, she could still um, carry on. After the three years, um, they went in, cleaned it out and refurbished her. Um, so she was very much a trial ship, I think, but um, did prove very successful in that. Mm -hmm. And so obviously, as we said, with the cancellation of the CVA01 CVA programme, they had four of these ships or possibly six on order um given how capable she actually was why do they just complete bristol and cancel all the others rather than just have the escorts anyway um, yeah. as big powerful warships because by the time bristol was launched they realized um, she was actually a very um manpower intensive ship she was big she had so many different weapon systems and at that time, the Type 42 was just um, gestating and they could carry some of the same weapons um, on a smaller, um, the, the famous treasury word, cheaper version. Mm -hmm. So it was decided she would be the only one and we would run with the Type 42s. Okay. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned, once she's, once she's launched, she's in the war, she doesn't have a carrier to escort anymore. Um, and she's become this this trials vessel. Was she purely a trials vessel, or was she also an active part of the fleet that was just sort of used for new systems as well? Sort of yes, yes, and no. She was a she got became known as a bit of a white elephant because nobody really knew what to do with her. Um, she carried on the trials, but she was part of the fleet and took part in various exercises, task force groups, and things like that. Whilst various weapons were tried. Um, tested and that um, but she was everybody was sort of saying what can we do with it well uh, and it reached a stage where she'd been in service and was proving her worth it would have been um, unacceptable to scrap it so she ploughed on fair enough and yeah. um, you, you mentioned that you know you've got the Akara, you've got the 4.5 inch gun um, limbo etc Presumably, as a carrier escort, she would have carried some kind of surface-to-air missile system as well? Yeah, she had also carried um, Sea Dart. Um, she was the first Royal Navy ship to be equipped with Sea Dart. And the launcher she had was immense, absolutely. And it was what they call the Mod Zero. The Type 42s had um, Type 1, which was a lot smaller. Um, sea Dart, again, was under development. They were improved it on there. It showed it worked. Um, out of all the ships in the Navy that carried Sea Dart, Bristol had the biggest magazine of the lot. Um, and the pictures I, I've got and have seen on the real thing, um, how the magazine worked is absolutely amazing. The, the missiles are quite 
you look at them in picture, they don't look big, they're huge. Um, and they were stored vertically and up on the, one of the bulkheads, there was an office window looking out and the officer could select the type of missile to be loaded. And this thing used to go around on a snake bed like that. And then at the end, two launchers that were dragged up, flash doors would open, missiles loaded, and away you went. Um, she actually did fire her missiles in anger later on in the Falklands. Um, I think she engaged two clouds and was apparently a successful hit. Um, but <laughs> she wasn't the only ship that got spooked by it. Um, an interesting story from those days um, with the Sudar, um, because of these flash doors that were like that, when they dropped open, up come missiles. At a particular point, two guys came out, leaning against the rails to have a smoke, um, which is where they apparently used to do it all the time. And they sat there, and then suddenly there's this awful rattling and rumbling, and they sort of look, the flash doors open, two white warshot missiles come up, and you can imagine the language between them. They just looked at each other, ran. They just got inside the um, superstructure, got one clip on the door, and there was a double whoosh. Um, they contacted something, loaded and fired, but they forgot to announce it to the whole ship. But it was there. And it's one of these tales you hear. And you, I think it's described so good. You can actually see these doors opening. The missiles come up. They come up at a fair rate. Um, and these two guys going, oh, other words, mm -hmm. and running. Mm -hmm. When they went back <laughs> out afterwards, there had been a headset and lead, and it was just a big blob of plastic. The railings were scorched, the deck was scorched. Um, so it worked. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, well, I suppose also Bristol being a relatively large ship for her time, um, was she able to operate helicopters? Um Controversial point to people who served on it. She if the, sort of the back end was officially designated as a helipad. Those who served um, say it wasn't. Um, their argument being she didn't have a hangar, therefore she didn't have a helipad, but she could operate helicopters, she could refuel them. And prior to the Falklands, she lost a fantastic fitting she had, which was plated over. Um, and it was designed to take heavier helicopters. So they could come in, they could do a vertical refuel or land. Um, the item that was removed, when she was upgraded, they took Limbo out because it was obsolete. I do not know and cannot find out. The captain thought it would be a cracking idea to make a swimming pool. So they turned the Limbo well into a swimming pool, complete with um, handrails, you find, and she bumbled along quite happily with the swimming pool. And <laughs> as the stories go, if they were tied up along and they had an American warship alongside them, um, they would wind them up and say, um, would you, you know, like to come across to our ship, have a bit of a barbecue and use the swimming pool? And they, the comment was, you guys have got a swimming pool. These limeys are winding this up. They come across and there they are. They've got the towels around and they're swimming away. And that's a, that's a genuine fact and well photographed. Um, <laughs> and they, how he got away with it, I don't know, because he decided it sounds a good plan, and they did it. Um, the only Royal Naval ship to have a swimming pool. Oh, that would that would have been a plum choice of position, I guess. Yeah. That, that that leads yeah. us on to the the, the no, next question. They were quite proud of it. You know, it was unique. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that leads us on to the question of what did her crew think of her? Because um, you've spoken to a fair number of them as well as being crew yeah. of her. So what did her crew think of her in operations? Um, the, you, you'd always get those who said, oh, it's the worst draft I had. The vast majority um, love her to bits. And when, it was, when she was sort of paid off, there was a big, um, let's save HMS Bristol. It was run by a cadet from America for some obscure reason. Um, I had the unique honour of being blocked from it because I asked him for the business plan. Um, having seen the, the work and the business plan for trying to save Hermes, I just wanted to point out, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's um, mm. very expensive. Um, that sort of died a death. They then put her up for auction and typical MOD, it was for sale recycle only. In other words, you can buy it, but don't you dare do anything else with it. You've got to cut it up. 
that didn't go too well. That hence the fact she still sat there. Um, there's another group started with a guy from um, from Gloucester himself. They've got uh, quite a few thousand things. Lord West, one of her old captains, has raised questions in the house. Why can't we save her? Um, my own feeling is I think she will eventually end up going to Turkey. Um, I don't know whether these guys have actually thought it through, but it is incredibly expensive. Um, if I can briefly explain it, the mm. head of the DRSO, the disposal, explained it to me, said, um, you want to buy a warship? Well, we've got one. Um, I'm going to say a silly figure, 100,000. Oh, wow, I can afford that. Oh, brilliant. So you're giving the money, the check clears. The first thing they say is, get that thing out of my harbour. No, no problem. I've got, a, I've got my tug sorted, about a thousand pound a day. So where you go on the tug, and you've actually got somewhere to berth it. You get in there, arc her up, do all the bits and pieces, connect it up to the mains, get all your brochures done, and you're going to open. Then health and safety come up and say, not opening. Well, why? Those companionways and ladders are far too steep for civilians. Okay, for guys who are in the forts, isn't it? They're going up and down them. You need to cut them. You think, well, we can cut the bulkheads because she's never going to save again. So you adjust all the ladders and the areas you're going to let people go to. Can we open? No. You're using the ship's wiring for your electricity. That's 450 volts. Doesn't comply with current legislation. Oh, for matter, matter, matter. So hmm. you change it all. Can we open? Oh, yeah. Good luck. So for 10 years, people come and see it and you're actually in the black. You then get a letter from Portsmouth, the Navy, saying you need to bring it down to a naval dockyard to put it in dry dock so we can inspect it, which is part of the Lloyd's contract insurance. So, oh, so you tow it all the way down, they dry dock it, they find fault, you pay for it, you take it away, back to your thing, you're probably back to square one, and that goes on every 10 years. So it's not a cheap thing. Hermes was lucky they had people with... Um, six-figure contracts that were willing to do it. Um, so it could be saved. It's a great loss um, mm. because she was used by the cadets. She was used by the Minister of Defence Police, divers, Marines. Um, you could wake up on there'd be a gunfight going on. It's the Marines clearing the ship. Um, <laughs> so we can only wait and see. Yeah. And uh, I suppose that, that then brings us on to you mentioned obviously she was in the Falklands. So what did Bristol do in nineteen eighty two in the Falklands War? Um she went down there as part of one of the backup groups after we started losing ships. Because of her size, she was ideal as um a command vessel. And for a while she was um the fleet headquarters. Um she escorted quite a bit and uh, she fired quite a few sea dart and then sort of came home. She was one of the lucky ones. She didn't come under fire, um, didn't lose anybody, thankfully. And she came home to a heroine's welcome. So, yeah, f f fairly lucky then. Um, they're being mostly on, uh, ironically enough, carrier escort duty. Yeah. <laughs> Finally um, got to do what she was designed to do. Yeah. When she came back from the Falklands, um, what, what was done with her after that? When she came back, she had, a, um, like most of the warships, she had a total refit. All her davits and sea boats were removed. And like everybody else, she ended up with um, rigid inflatables. As she is at the moment, she was fitted for, but never got it, um, phalanx. But what she did get, um, her original small arms, which were the, you know, the really old 20mm um, Orlican, she got the twin 30mm power operated one, and she got single um, modern version of the Orlicans. So they built what they call a gun deck. So she was incredibly well armed. That was on, on port and starboard. Towards the end, they thought they would fit it for um, phalanx, and then it never happened. After that, um, she carried on serving in the fleet, and then it was decided she was getting long in the tooth. She was um, labour intensive, so she was paid off. She paid off. And then she became the harbour training ship and placed in the county class destroyer Kent. The role of the harbour training ship and accommodation is um, it's parked there permanently and they use it for training. They used to bring um, training, 
training marine engineers down, put them down in the engine room and the gearbox room and say, right, trace the pipes. And if you go down it today, all across the pipes, you'll see um, steam, water, gas, whatever. And it was said, there's your equipment. I want you to move that from there to here. And it was giving them, although engine rooms are a lot more spacious today, they're still not that big and it was giving them an idea that when they actually went on their first ship they were going to have to work in cramped confined spaces going to have to do lots of manual work to get bits from there than that uh already touched on it the name the Royal marines used to use it to practice hostage rescue on a ship mod police used to use it for doing the same thing and every so often um, the divers would go underneath partly to check on her condition and um, to keep their diving ticket up to date. She became an overflow accommodation um, for Whale Island, and the main users towards the end were youth groups, and mostly that was a sea cadet. She could host 450 young people in one go, which is an awful lot, plus their adult staff. They didn't have to do much to convert it. All they had, the real conversion was signs saying female heads, male heads um she lost a galley um apart from a very small tea room for the staff so they anybody staying on board would have to go to the main mess at the top of whale island and she served the sea cadets absolutely brilliant she went away 10 years ago to heaven up in the north for a refit where they cut the mast down they removed the radar um and did lots of refurbishment together for 10 years just before the dreaded COVID, she was due to go for another one to give her five years. Um, the major change would have been some new G plan furniture, and at a request of schools, the heads would become unisex. So, um, which really didn't go down well because, as it was, it kept the boys away from the girls. Um, mm -hmm. That was due to happen. Oh, there are little horrors at times. Um, that was due to happen, and then for various reasons, which I won't discuss on this, uh, it was decided she didn't represent the modern Navy. Um, anybody seeing it would think the Navy's out of date. Um, the bit that was missed there was to, to actually get up close to see her, you had to get into Whale Island. Um, you, you could see it on the um, harbour tour. Um, so they decided she would be um, paid off in December 2020. They actually brought it forward. And... To November, and she's sat there now, still waiting to see what would happen. And there's it's a generation of rumors, you know, oh, she's going to be replaced by um, nobody knows yet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. great loss. Well, there, really. There's not really much else in the Navy that they could decommission to be put in her place, really. Um, not that hold that many cadets. The trouble is, um, one of the rumors was we'd have smaller ships located around the countries, three of them. Um, but you still need to come to Whale Island because that's where the training establishments are. The sea cadets have a big spread down there. So you still have to come there. Um, Rumour control has it that that might happen, but until it actually happens, I'm going to sit and wait. Um, there's even a rumour yeah. saying, let's bring it back into service. I don't <laughs> think that will happen. Um, so that's yeah. really it. She sat there looking very forlorn and rusting away, to be honest. Yeah, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but you, I understand, served aboard Bristol for a, a reasonable period of time um, in the past past few years. Um, what was it like serving aboard Bristol during that last stage of her active career? Um, because she was permanently moored, um, she had these sliding moorings like they have on the jetties so the, the crew was reduced we had the captain an exo a couple of petty officers and a slack handful of seamen um and that was about it their role really was to keep the ship in good order um and to be there to maintain naval type discipline for when the cadets were launched on it um it was an admirable eye opener to cadets to see what it was like on the Navy. It was always amazing when you brought them down. Um, on the bunks was made a duvet and a duvet cover. And 
do put it together, same as you would when you join a ship. Um, and watching the cadets' expressions on how to do it, so you can see who makes the duvets at home. Um, it gave them an insight of what it was like and how much stowage space you have, you know, I or don't have. Um, and the fact that, you know, if you were serving, you kept your kit to the minimum. Um, it also gave them an idea that, of walking around, trying to find your way. Um, the terminology, uh, where your cabin was, it was on, you know, certain deck, it was a certain letter and a certain number. And it gave them that sort of insight that how to learn um, a completely different language. Now, as you said, she's she's still there for who knows how long, um, but she's got a huge, huge service history behind her. So if people want to learn more about HMS Bristol, um, how can they do that? I understand there's a book <laughs> somewhere that they can buy. Funnily enough, yes, there is. Um, if you go on to Amazon or Morton Publishing, uh, Morton Publishing have recently taken over quite a few of the model magazines, such as Modern Boats and stuff like that. Um, this year's, or this month's issue has actually got my book on HMS Bristol as a prize, which I feel quite proud of. Um, the book I've done is about £16, depending where you buy it from. And what I've tried to do, um, there are a couple of other books that have been produced by the association, but they're very, um, HMS Bristol was built in so-and-so, it was launched in so-and-so, and it is like that. What I've tried to do is describe the ship and then the rest of the book, I've tried to get the crew to tell me things. Um, the story of the sea dart came from the crew. Um, mm -hmm. The stories of where people used to sort of sneak away for a legal cigarette and then fall asleep and suddenly realise, you know, what's going on. And I've tried to get them to tell me the stories. Um, some people have been a bit iffy about it, sort of saying, what happens in the wardroom mess should stay there. Um, and I said, but 45 years you know, they're not going to come looking for you unless you've done something really bad. Um, I can make you anonymous. I mean, there's a couple of people who give me cracking stories that I've asked to stay anonymous. Some of them are hilarious, and um, uh, hopefully I've written it so you can picture them. One of them, guy was due to be promoted, went ashore with his not boat to um, have a few beers. They had more than that. Came back, they'd missed the Liberty boat, so they nicked somebody's boat and they were driving around and bumping off Bristol, which didn't help because the Admiral was, had been there for um, dinner and they kept doing it. Um, and the famous cry was, Well, we're in the poo now. Once again, Colts and once round, they went round, took the boat. Um, the Navy police brought them back. They were on discipline in the morning. Um, he was told he wasn't such a good sailor as they thought. Um, one got a small stoppage of pay and he got promoted a couple of days later. So common sense, I think, there. <laughs> um, but what I've, I've tried to make it where right? it's not me telling you that I'm on the bit so and so we can find this. Um, probably the most I've done is I've done a guided tour from when you came on the ship and then the history and the, the antics and that I've left to the crew, which I think is a different way of doing it. And Morton's layout and they are probably the best publishers I've ever worked with. They're modern, up-to-date, and they will listen to the author. And you say, I don't like that. Oh, why not? Give them a reason. If they agree with you, they'll go with it. So um, I hope I've done it justice. There's some cracking photos. Some of them in there have never, ever been seen in public. Well, uh, that's definitely a book I'm going to pick up because um, yeah. I must admit the, the first, if you like, serious naval history book that I was ever given when I was a child was um, the Imperial War Museum book at the War of Sea, a book of the War at Sea by Julian Thompson. And it's basically the same kind of thing where it's kind of like, you know, Dunkirk happened, but here's Dunkirk from the point of view of everyone who was there. And yeah. it, it, make, it makes history come alive in a way that, you know, raw facts and figures never really can. So... Yes. Uh, definitely everyone uh, links below um for uh, amazon and morton books and yeah pick pick up a copy and uh, enjoy it because i'm Please certainly do. going to at the moment it seems to be doing incredibly well which i'm very pleased about it's probably mm. my best book um hence the fact why i want to do the same thing for type 23 i'm just waiting for the navy now yeah well if if anyone's watching who's uh, currently uh serving in one of the higher echelons of the navy we need we need, we need to get rob on board a, a type 23 please thank you um so yeah thank you very much for the for the information and the interview um everybody um 
Chief Petty Officer Rob Griffin, uh, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful guest. And um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, see a lot more people re reading about HMS Bristol and learning about her unique history. So thank yeah. you so much once again for coming. It's a pleasure being here. <laughs> thank you. Okay. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.